Hi everyone, I'm Wells Fray-Smith and we are here for the latest edition of State of the Arts for the Institutum with the filmmaker and photographer Alex Prager. And we're in London at Lehman Maupin where she is presenting her eighth solo exhibition in London. It's called Part One, The Mountain. And I really can't overstate the importance of Alex and Alex in the genre of image making. Her works are familiar yet strange. They're so full of paradoxes and contradictions. Characters are staged in costumes, colors are vivid, and they are out there in the world, but they make us think about ourselves, our psychology and inner states. So Alex, I wanna deep dive into the 10 works that you have in this show. Um, but before we look at pieces specifically, can you tell us a bit about how you got the title, The Mountain, and how these works really gestated for you? Yes, um, The Mountain felt appropriate because of everything we've just been experiencing and feeling over the last almost two and a half years now. And also before that, because let's be honest, we probably wouldn't be in the state we are now if stuff wasn't already going wrong yeah. leading yeah. up to this. The mountain seemed really appropriate because I felt, I mean, I was pulling from how I was feeling over the last two years and, and I was really reprioritizing my life a lot and kind of making my circle a bit smaller mm -hmm. to really focus in on nurturing uh, my immediate vicinity, myself, my family. I started a um, a vegetable garden oh, at my house nice. and we got chickens and we yeah. built a chicken coop and um, I started sewing again and that was because I was having a new perspective on life based on all the turmoil and frustrations yeah. and everything that's been upended disruptions through the pandemic and so the mountain um, is this place that people have gone for centuries in storytelling mm -hmm. and Greek mythology to really reevaluate themselves, have sort of a, um, an emotional kind of upheaval, a place where they can be reborn again. So there were so many reasons why the mountain seemed really fitting for that. Yeah, and you talk about this upheaval, death, rebirth, and so much of that I think is, is in the work and yeah. we can see it in these two pieces behind us. I wondered if we could talk about this one first okay. because it has the mountain in it, <laughs> crucially. <Yes. laughs> but we also see essentially this cowboy, right? With his revolver cast up in the air. Something has happened to him and we have to figure out what. What was your kind of starting point for this image? Do you have a story in mind? This was one of the first images that I conceived in my dreaming about the mountain, this was the first one that I thought of. Because it really encapsulated how I was feeling. Yeah. And I think because I was feeling that, everyone else was feeling that to some degree or another. I felt so many different um, psychological and emotional states all, all through the spectrum of what, what a person can feel, I felt it. And I thought what was interesting was, because we've been so polarized and our beliefs on how we got here and whose fault it is and, you know, all of these conversations that we've all been having that have been so angry and so uncomfortable, I kind of felt like in the end it didn't really matter because we're here yeah. and this is how we feel. And we're all feeling the exact same things, regardless of why we're feeling these things. Mm. We're all feeling them and we're all feeling them together. And so it made me think about how we're so similar rather than how we're so different. You know, I, I, I started thinking about what connected us. Yeah. And these states of being throughout the pandemic have actually, even though, it's, you know, we've been very disconnected, physically and communication wise, we haven't really been having very good communication, especially over the internet and social media and stuff. These pictures were really trying to show that we are very similar and we do, as, as individual as we are and as different as we are, we're allowed to feel all sorts of ways and, and it's those feelings that connect us. Yeah. Kind of, but. Yeah. I mean, I felt that so much going through this exhibition for the first time. It was the identification with all these figures, different as they are. You know, it was like the agony, yeah. maybe 
ecstasy, yes. concentration, like surrender, you know, you, you hit at all of these emotional registers. Yeah. When I saw Definitely. this one, I thought, this is me. Yeah. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly me right now. Clearly it's not me, but I am this state of being. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about this figure of the cowboy and your interest, I guess, in American types. Americana, exactly, <laughs> it's perfect. Um, because we have the cowboy, we'll see in other works in the show, there's a kind of casino goer, yeah. there's a flight attendant. Where do these types come from? What is that interest for you? They're um, archetypes that have been used in storytelling for since the beginning of time. And I really wanted to use those as a tool to tell the story of something very universal. Because of the polarization and, and the, um, just like this abrasiveness between people, you know, as dark as, as the subject is and as uncomfortable as it's been, um, I really want it to be about um, connection and, and, un and trying to understand each other more, which is why I shot portraiture. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a way that we've used, it's a tool we've used forever in art to be able to really look at one another and see each other. And by seeing each other, we can understand each other better and, and yeah. understand a bit about ourselves. Portraiture is a departure for you, right? But yeah. 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 And how, how did it feel to come back to it? At first, when I had the idea, it felt really wrong. Yeah. Because, you know, and from an, coming from an analytical state it felt just like well what the fuck am i doing because i've been doing bigger and bigger and bigger and more ambitious projects every yeah. time why would i go down to this smaller kind of more simple mm -hmm. way of looking but in the end i mean really like right away it just made so much sense because like it would have been completely wrong to do a crowd picture everyone agrees on that right <laughs> yeah. and a socially um, distanced crowd yeah. yeah and also you know at first i thought about um because i have used when i do crowd pictures in the past i have um made cardboard cutouts of people i've done like blow up dolls and mannequins mm. mixed in with real people. So I thought about like using artifice to the, like to a, on a different degree yeah. because of the pandemic, but that just felt really wrong too. It, it didn't interest me. And, um, and what did interest me was the individual and people and the, and all the little details that make up each individual and makes them what makes them so unique that's what's so incredible about people like this film that i made that's two minutes long it's just a taste of listening to these people talk about unrelated things which is you know i tried to, to make the pictures about people that were unrelated mm. and in the unrelated and very different little nuggets of truth about these individuals you find understanding and connection yeah. because the more detailed I am, the more universal I feel like the work becomes. Yeah, well, that's one of the cool paradoxes that you find in the work. It does have this real specificity. Maybe we can look at one photograph over here at Daybreak because the details in this one are amazing. Yep. We have California registered on this map, mm -hmm. I guess, but we also see details about the constructedness mm -hmm. of the image which i love this element here it's like you can see the muscle suit that he's wearing and again at his wrist and so maybe this is a great opportunity to ask about ambiguity in mm -hmm. some way it's detailed but it's also universal it's very constructed but mm -hmm. hyper real in many ways you know it, it teeters on these edges is ambiguity yeah. important for you Reality and artifice are constantly mm. kind of dancing and weaving in and out of each other in real life anyway. Like if, for instance, this is a kind of weird idea, but if somebody were to make a movie based in 2021 and they just used everything that came out in the year 2021, yeah. then it just wouldn't be real, yeah. right? So 2021, or it's a weird, um, a weird year to, to use, but <laughs> let's say like 20, 2008, yeah, cool. um, less, emotional triggering yeah. um but like let's say 2008 um it had you know there's things from 
hundreds of years ago in 2008, there's things from 20 years ago, there's mm. things from five years ago. It also contributes to now and mm. to, to reality mm. always because reality wouldn't be here without first yeah. conceiving that idea with your imagination. So yeah. I'm constantly like going in and out of what's real and what, what's going to become real. It's just an interesting concept. I've always loved the idea of blurring um, reality and fiction because they are two of the same, they're cut from the same cloth. What you're hinting at too, it sounds like this kind of blurring of time, mm -hmm. that like yes. you're evoking the past at the same time that these figures are maybe cast into a future dream. And time is very specific in this work because mm -hmm. all the works have titles that relate to time in some way. So this one is Daybreak. Um, the one we just looked at was High Noon. Can you tell us about the titling of all, all these pieces and how time figured in your thinking? Time is definitely a theme in the work because time has been a theme in the last two years, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Um, a lot of people will say that, um, like, where did the time go? Or what month is it? What year is it? It's been a theme um, with a lot of people, um, a very abstract theme. Mm -hmm. It's like we're living in the past, but we've all aged two years what's even happened, what have we accomplished in two years, what's even, what's even going on. <laughs> yeah. So I really wanted to have that as a concept in the works. And also, um, for me, I've just always loved the idea that time is really just um, an agreement. It's really just like another story that we tell each other. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, and speaking of stories, I just, I, I really wanted to, to connect these, um, these these stories with stories that that we've known f from you know from media and from storytelling mm. classical books and movies we've seen because i really wanted to just get that timelessness into um what we've experienced right now it just gives us a, a big a broader perspective yeah like knowing that it's happened before in some other way we've lived through this yeah which is why i use um the concept of nostalgia or like old Hollywood or retro. Yeah, th I mean, that figures so much in, in this piece that has a very old Hollywood feel mm. and retro feel in part because of her outfit. And I think I really see what you were getting at, that it has this timelessness, but also time specificity because of the title, This mm -hmm. Is Afternoon. And I, I wondered about light in all of these works and if that has been a, a tool for you to suggest different times of day in some way because just contrasting them it seems like light is always really coming in from the side in some way the light was one of the first things i started thinking about with these i scribbled yeah. i scribbled down like the um, convulsive states that, mm. that i wanted them to be hanging Initially, I was kind of um, rejecting that idea, but then once I, once I embraced it, I realized it's so com complicated to do these types of portraits yeah. because of this, uh, so many unknowns happening on set and the suspension of this state in the air. And it just became like an am ambitious project in a totally new way mm. that I wasn't expecting. But yeah, Matthew Libatique and I sat down and we spoke about, um, we spoke a lot about lighting and each setup to really evoke that yeah. time of day, but also that emotional state. Yeah. The lighting is so clever too, because it, it makes you look. I wanted to ask you about this state of suspension because in, in some images, this one in particular, she seems in many ways to be floating, mm -hmm. as though you've been able to capture some type of stillness amongst lots of moving and chaos around her. And we don't see the mountain, but kind of literally, it's like everything has been thrown up in the air mm -hmm. and we don't know where exactly. it's gonna land. Is that, yeah, that yeah, yeah. the Yeah, it really felt thinking. like this is kind of the state that I've been in just not knowing what the future holds, feeling very unsettled, yeah. feeling very much like everything is just a big, unknowable, lurking. I mean, that brings me to Eclipse. Yeah, yeah, um, let's have a look. Yeah, it's, it's just been very unknowable. 
um, but it feels very powerful. This for this you know powerful force that's completely out of our control mm. and um, and very unknown, very mm. mysterious. So yeah, so. This one was also one of the ones that I conceived early on because I needed something to kind of represent that for me and reflect that. Yeah. I needed that to be reflected back to me because it's been so confusing. What caused this? What is this? Mm. What's real about it? What's not real? You know, all of these questions that we've all had, I wanted to make an image to reflect those questions. I mean, obviously, I think it's not you, but... Um, well, everything is me. It, it, yeah. it has that, that element. Especially that guy. This one feels quite different from the others because it's not set in the sky, not in a state of suspension. Yeah, tell me about this art. Yeah, so people have been asking me why I included this one, like what's the meaning? So these other ones are reflective of psychological or emotional states, more um, the mountain being those states of being. And this one was the one to kind of ground all of those states of being in the physical mm. place that we've been experiencing this in. So, you know, it, it has been like a kind of purgatory or waiting room, eternal sort of feeling of just like waiting for it to end, but not knowing where we're going, but knowing that time is just slipping by every day and ticking away, and, but nothing's really happening. So this one <laughs> represented that perfectly for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's that endless drive <laughs> and the sense that maybe you're driving toward the light, but you have no idea when, yeah. when you'll reach it. Yeah, and there's that bend there that just, we don't know what's around that bend. What's around the corner. Mm -hmm. There was something deeply unsettling about this for me as well, because of course you don't see the eyes and that's characteristic in this work, that there's not any eye contact mm -hmm. with the subjects. But her facial angle, almost implies that she's not really looking at the road. Mm -hmm. You know, her eyes might be cast off somewhere else. So it, it has this feeling too for me of like the blind leading the blind. Like yeah. we really don't know yeah. where we're going. We cannot see it Yeah, at all. road to nowhere. The, the road to nowhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. But ultimately that said, you know, ultimately this is supposed to be a very um, optimistic yes. body of work. I wanted to kind of have it be a celebration of the end in a way yeah. because we've all kind of lost ourselves in this and um, and now it's time to be reborn. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Finally. So that's, the, that's the hope. Yeah <laughs> and um, you mentioned the end which also actually brings me to your beginnings and I've read and heard you talk before about a photograph you saw by William Eggleston that was transformational for you. Can mm -hmm. you tell me about, about that and what that photograph was? Yeah, it was, it was a good one because it makes no sense um, analytically that I would be, that would be my reason for doing every, everything that catapulted me into this. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it was like the shoe, the dirty shoes, under the bed shot. Mm. Um, when I saw that image, I'd never seen photography being used as art before that. And um, I'd only ever seen it used as fashion or advertising. And so when I saw that image and I felt what I felt, which was this kind of overwhelming, kill me now, or I'm <laughs> like, just like so, so much feeling just yeah. running through me all at once. And then I looked at the, at the picture that was supposedly creating this um, sensation in me. And it was so seemingly mundane mm. and ordinary that it was that juxtaposition of like, what the fuck is going on yeah. right now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had to know not only why, why was it doing that to me, but also how can I do that to other people? Yes. Um, and now that I know more about photography and filmmaking, aside from his color and composition and stuff, I think the, f the very fact that it was um, a detail about somebody's life, mm. it was, a, it was a, a small bit of a story about an individual who is very unique. I think that's something that just, um, you know, underneath all the layers of artifice that always has to be there, that heart of of a real person kind of pulsating underneath yeah. all the layers of artifice. Yeah. Um, and that really had that for me, so. And yeah. that is, is so in this work too. And that 
uh, moment of finding the extraordinary in the ordinary is, is, is in the work. Thank you. Yeah.